Kolmosh will talk about fairness and accessibility in language testing for candidates with specific learning difficulties. Many of you will know Judith Kornmosch, especially if you're also familiar with the field of applied linguistics. Judith has been a professor in second language acquisition at Lancaster University since 2008. And as that, she has also been teaching on the well-known MA language testing program, program for nearly 10 years. Judith spent the first phase of her academic career in Hungary, where she originally gained her PhD degree in linguistics and then the habilitation title through her book on second language speech production. We know Judith as a researcher in a number of areas of psycholinguistics, including the study of cognitive factors in language learning. Her interest in the topic of her keynote talk goes back to her time in Hungary. In a research project funded by the Hungarian authorities, she investigated dyslexic language learners' experiences in classroom language learning and in language proficiency exams. This directed her attention to the issues, to issues of fairness and accessibility in assessment more generally. Judith has contributed to many projects and published widely on the topic. Moreover, she has advised numerous language testing organizations on their access arrangement policies for test takers with disabilities. One almost can't stop when talking about Judith's merits but I don't want to take more of her speaking time. So thank you, Judith, for your tremendous sustained effort that serves, us, serves all of us and for honoring us with a keynote talk today. The floor is yours. There will be time for questions at the end. Thank you very much, Peter, for the lovely introduction. And I'm really grateful for the opportunity to speak at the EALTA conference. And I'm honored by the invitation. I was very happy to accept the invitation when originally the call went out that the conference would be held in Budapest, which is my hometown. And I was really looking forward to hosting uh, my dear colleagues, uh, former students, current PhD students um, in, in Budapest. Um, and, and it's a shame that uh, didn't happen. What, as Peter told us, we have saved our planet uh, in a number of ways. Nonetheless, um, my daughter curated some of the photos that she had been taking during this pandemic year in Budapest. So I'll, I'll include photos of Budapest so that at least you feel that <laughs> you are present in Budapest. And I'm actually also talking from, from Budapest. So um, the title of my, my talk is Fairness and Accessibility. Um, in um, for candidates with specific um, learning difficulties. And um, before um, actually going into details about fairness and accessibility, I'd like to explain why this topic is important. Um, and here you see um, Franz uh, Josef, one of the penultimate um, emperors of the multilingual Austro-Hungarian Empire in a recent mini statue, looking over the Danube, which is um, kind of the representation of, of multilingualism and, and multiculturalism in, in Central um, Europe. So um, we know that many regions of Europe have been multilingual and language competence has been very important in many areas of life um, for, um, for people in general, but also for, for language learners. Um, if we think about the UK, for example, uh, language competence uh, is crucial for immigration uh, purposes um, for um, in Hungary, um, gaining a language certificate is, um, is uh, a prerequisite for obtaining your university degree. You're, you cannot um, get your degree uh, into your hands actually before you, can, you, met, uh, you show um, uh, evidence that you uh, have uh, acquired at least um, a B2 level competence um, in, in language proficiency. So um, it's not only language competence, but the ability to demonstrate and the need to demonstrate your language knowledge is um, crucial in everyday life. 
And again, just to illustrate with a very recent Hungarian example, um, there has been a recent political debate with the elections coming up. And one of the uh, most popular um, opposition uh, candidates uh, for the prime ministerial position um, has uh, been found to, um, to lack some of his English language uh, competence. And he was the target uh, of, um, of a campaign uh, that was centered around um, a competition between uh, who speaks English better among um, prime ministerial candidates. And um, as the debate unfolded, um, it turned out that the current mayor, the prime ministerial candidate, actually has dyslexia. And one of the reasons that he hasn't uh, been successful in learning English uh, is due to his dyslexia. So that takes us um, um, to, to the issue of specific learning difficulties, which affect around 10 to 10, 15% of the population. And, um, and, and this, uh, this is a large proportion. We can't really ignore um, the needs of 10-15% of our students who are also increasingly becoming more represented among test takers. And there are more test takers with disabilities um, over, over time. And they need to, the needs and abilities of these students need to be taken into account so that they are not disadvantaged in assessment. And, and Dina Tsagaris and Spanodis' book in 2013 was really instrumental in highlighting the need for more research on, on this um, area because it was neglected for a, for a long time. Um, so the lesson is really that valid and fair uh, tests uh, need to be implemented for every student, including those um, with uh, specific uh, learning difficulties. In this talk, um, I'm going to, the talk is going to have three parts. Um, I'm going to um, give a, a theoretical overview, uh, which will uh, be centered around issues of, um, of fairness, universal design, accommodations and modifications, um, what these are, how they have been conceptualized in, in the literature. Then I'm going to um, um, show you two recent research studies that uh, we have conducted uh, with colleagues, uh, one about uh, read aloud modification or read aloud adjustments, and the other uh, about time extension, where we specifically researched whether these uh, test adjustments uh, benefit uh, students uh, with specific learning difficulties or with different literacy profiles. And then I'll end um, the talk uh, with implications uh, for assessment and, and directions for, for future uh, research. The test, the issue of test fairness um, is, is a very important one. And, and it is a thread um, that, uh, that runs through, um, I think, the majority of research conducted um, in, in our field, um, because it is very strongly intertwined with the uh, issue of test validity and, and validity and fairness and ethics in, in language testing are very strongly interlinked. And this is also represented in the, in the four principles uh, of, of the four characteristics of test fairness, which um, have been um, 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 proposed um, by the Joint Committee Standards of major uh, organizations in the United States that deal with assessment, educational assessment, psychological assessment, so uh, AERE, APA, and the National Council for Measurement in Education and Ethics and Fairness, and also um, runs through the, the, the policies of, of language testing organizations. So the first um, principle um, of uh, test fairness is fair and equitable tre treatment in the testing uh, process uh, and in the testing uh, context. And uh, what this principle um, embodies is that we need to uh, provide um, circumstances uh, to our test takers, which allow them to be uh, demonstrate what they know um, and which do not prevent them from performing to the best of their knowledge. And so essentially here we are talking about test administration procedures and conditions, which sometimes need to be modified so that students can actually demonstrate the best of their abilities. One example is, for example, for students 
patients uh, with ADHD, attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder, or students on the autism spectrum, they might uh, prefer, and they actually do prefer, being tested in a solitary environment because their attention uh, can be distracted by people around them, by the noise um, uh, around them, and, and maybe with people with uh, the autism spectrum disorder, it causes social anxiety for them if there are a lot of people in the room. So that's uh, uh, when that's 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 a, a condition for uh, for fair and equitable treatment in the testing process that we take in, these needs into account and we react to them and, and try to ensure the circumstances for these uh, students. So that they can perform to the best of their abilities. The next principle is uh, fairness as the lack or absence of, uh, of measurement bias. Um, and here we are um, uh, actually uh, considering uh, whether um, the test uh, systematically uh, disadvantages a specific group of, of, of students who come uh, from, let's say, different first language background or social backgrounds. And, and in principle, students uh, should perform, um, um, should have equal chances to perform well on the test or pass a test, regardless of their socioeconomic background or first language characteristics. Um, but we know very well, for example, for intelli from intelligence testing, that, that certain types of tests actually do show systematic bias towards uh, specific groups. And for example, considering background knowledge when constructing assessment is, is very important. Um, and, and also I have seen that there will be um, a number of uh, presentations on, on localized language testing, uh, which is very important from, uh, from a fairness perspective. Um, the next um, 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 principle of uh, principal characteristic of test fairness is uh, fairness as access to the to the constructs uh, measures, and this is accessibility, but uh, issues around construct validity, and uh, here accessibility, the new term accessibility that was introduced to the um, standards in 2014 in, in the comparison with the earlier standards of fairness, um, basically talks about uh, ensuring that no other additional components or knowledge skills should be required to perform the tasks uh, in addition to what the task aims to, to measure. So for example, if we uh, assess uh, listening and the response format requires um, lengthy written answers, that we are introducing some construct irrelevant uh, variables into the assessment process that might systematically again disadvantage certain students, for example, those with specific learning difficulties who find it challenging to write uh, longer answers when we actually want to gain an insight into their um, listening abilities. And this is also um, going to be an important issue when we are moving towards integrated assessment, um, assessment of, of multimodal um, skills uh, to examine how actually these um, um, test tasks, test input um, uh, materials might create um, uh, some construct irrelevant uh, bias or might interact with certain individual characteristics of, um, of test takers that prevent them again to perform to the best of their knowledge. And, and finally, fairness as validity of individual test uh, score interpretations for the intended use. Um, uh, again, this is um, very important for, um, for localized uh, language testing, where we have to make sure that the test that we are using that has been um, normed, standardized, uh, designed for a specific uh, population and, and then is applied elsewhere, whether the score interpretations actually hold for that um, new uh, context. And I was, I'm really looking forward to, to the symposia um, today that, that discuss these issues of fairness. So um, these issues around fairness and accessibility uh, lead us um, to universal test design and special arrangements. Universal design is a relatively new term in education. It is concerned with ensuring that uh, teaching materials, teaching tasks uh, are accessible for a wide variety of, of users. And actually it puts the, um, the onus and the responsibility uh, for um, designing uh, instructional materials, test tasks 
uh, that are accessible for, for everyone on the test designer. And we have to anticipate what are the features of our test that might cause disadvantages for students, but that might impede them to do well. And we have to design tests that already kind of uh, proactively take into account the, the needs of, of these students and are accessible universally by, by everyone. Um, universal test design was actually around as a term a lot earlier than universal design um, appeared uh, as an educational uh, concept. Um, and um, uni uh, uh, proponents of universal test design, um, which originated in the USA, uh, argued that um, we uh, we can create tests that uh, they are uh, that are universally accessible for everyone, and then we can do away with special arrangement and and assess and, and and adjustments. Unfortunately, this is quite an idealistic uh, view. We'll still uh, need um, probably uh, special arrangements because uh, just taking the needs of uh, visually impaired and hearing impaired candidates into account, I don't think we can meet the needs uh, of both groups. Of, of test takers in one, one single test, but it's, it's, I find it a very important concept that gives us the responsibility to take into account the needs of, um, of students. So uh, this is uh, embodied in the principle uh, that tests should be constructed and administered so that accommodations become unnecessary. Um, how can we um, uh, as language testers, researchers um, um, ensure that um, our test is accessible. Uh, we have to very carefully examine the test construct and the set of tasks and um, make sure that we avoid uh, that some individual characteristics of test takers cause bias or result in construct irrelevant variance. And this is um, this kind of research has just recently started in the field of language testing, and we conducted um, two studies. One, um, the first one, Michel Kormos Brunfeld and Rathaitzak in 2018, uh, that um, uh, 2019, sorry, that looked into second language writing processes and, and products, and to what extent uh, working memory might uh, mediate students' performance on particular writing tasks. Uh, we also, in, in, in the ETS Young Learners Test, because for young learners, there's still quite a large variation in working memory capacity, and it can create a construct irrelevant variance if certain tasks uh, disadvantage, for example, students with lower working memory capacity. We did a similar um, study in, um, on reading, and, and, and Wallace's uh, research, relative recent research, um, also examine this question, also in the young ETS Young Learners uh, test uh, in the area of listening. Um, as I said, universal test design is probably um, not um, um, the solution to, to every student's need. So we will still um, um, be, we will still uh, need to provide certain adjustments to the testing process uh, and the accommodation and the testing administration conditions. And one way of providing these adjustments is giving accommodations that do not change the contract to be assessed. So this can include modifying the presentation format, the response format, the timing, the test setting. So obviously most of these probably don't change the construct that we want to assess. Um, sometimes it's uh, necessary to uh, provide adjustments that uh, go beyond accommodations, and they might actually have an impact on the construct to be assessed. So for example, with hearing impaired candidates, um, it might be actually necessary to, um, to provide a written transcript instead of a, a, a listening text. So that's obviously a modification because you are not assessing the, the, the spoken language decoding component of the language test. So you can only use portions of a test, for example, if you don't assess the spelling skills of these lexic students, Again, spelling is a part of the written um, of the writing construct, so that again is a modification. And in this um, uh, in these cases, you would probably have an endorsement on the test certificate that certain uh, elements of the test uh, were not used or or they were modified. So um, when um, uh, testing agencies um, decide. Uh, or when we as, as test designers uh, decide um, 
how do we support um, students with specific learning difficulties when um, they request an accommodation or an adjustment or when we find through our research that certain types of adjustments are helpful for students with specific difficulties. Then I have drawn up this flowchart that I hope is useful for, for guiding us in, in such uh, decision uh, processes. And, and also I think they can um, uh, be useful for, um, for research purposes. How do we research? How do we set up a project? How do we analyze um, um, ch changes that we implement in test, um, or test uh, conditions? So first of all, we can ask, ask the question, does the accommodation affect the construct? So this is a theoretical question, a validation uh, question. And, and if we um, if we find based on a validation argument that the accommodation affects the construct, then um, this is a modification. And, um, and pro then we make a decision, okay, do we offer it, this to the students or, or, or not, or do we offer it and endorse it on the certificate? Uh, if we find that the accommodation doesn't affect the construct, then the next question is whether this accommodation is actually helpful or useful. In other words, whether the accommodation improves the scores of students uh, with disabilities. And, and there is actually very little research that, uh, that systematically investigates whether accommodations that testing agencies offer or we offer in our national exams are actually beneficial or they are just based on anecdotal evidence. So if the accommodation doesn't improve the scores of students with disabilities, then the accommodation is probably not useful. One example that I'm going to show on the next slide is uh, colored overlays, which have been frequently uh, suggested as, um, as useful ways to alleviate visual stress for dyslexic candidates. Um, students report that they uh, find colored overlays useful. However, when we systematically investigate um, the impact of colored uh, overlays on reading accuracy and reading comprehension, they, they have no uh, benefits whatsoever. So if the accommodation improves the scores of um, students with disabilities, um, then we can again move a step further and ask ourselves whether the, the accommodation also improves the scores of other students, because it can happen that we are offering an accommodation which would actually also assist students who don't have uh, specific uh, learning difficulties. If we find that no, that's not the case, that's excellent, and then we can grant the accommodation and then our work is done and, 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 and dusted. If we find that the students, uh, that the accommodation improves the scores of other students too, then um, we again need to go a step further and ask whether uh, the scores of students with disabilities uh, improve more than those of uh, students with no uh, disabilities. Because um, some um, theories of, of special adjustments um, argue that, um, that perhaps um, accommodations can also be granted without actually granting the same um, or changing the test administration procedures for non-disabled candidates if there is a differential boost to the scores of students with uh, disabilities. If um, the scores of students with disabilities um, don't uh, improve more than those of students with uh, no uh, SPLDs, then that means that the accommodation actually changes the meaning of the scores for everyone. And that then we really need to consider whether this should be a universal design feature. And we'll talk about time extension, which uh, might um, serve as a good example for, for this kind of uh, flowchart. And sorry, right. So if the scores of students with disabilities improve more than uh, those of, uh, with no SPLDs, then uh, the accommodation might be granted. Um, it's not such a clear case of universal design and not uh, in such a clear case as the yellow one where I say should be granted, but again, it might be granted. So I hope that this um, flowchart can be used perhaps when you design uh, tests as testing agencies or in national um, testing um, uh, endeavors um, in, in high stakes context, but also in classroom uh, context. I have also collected um, um, a table of uh, some typical testing adjustments um, that um, are offered in, um, 
and language testing uh, context, they can be divided into four categories, accommodations in presentation format, accommodations in response format, accommodations in timing and accommodations in, in setting. Um, the easiest case uh, from the validity uh, point of view uh, is accommodations in setting because they don't affect the construct. They are actually, in practical terms, they might be tricky to, to arrange. They, they require more resources um, from test centers, from teachers in terms of um, uh, supervision, etc. Uh, accommodations in timing. Um, I'll, I'll talk about them more in, the, in, in this lecture, in the second half of, of, of this presentation. Um, they, they can be useful, again, in terms of uh, uh, implementation and, and, and test administration. They can be tricky because, again, you need more rooms, more, more supervision, um, more scheduling activities. Um, accommodations in response format, they need to be uh, considered quite um, carefully. Um, and, and some of these have actually been now become now superfluous with the introduction of computer-based uh, um, uh, testing, and particularly during pandemic times, because now everybody uses a computer for, for assessment. You don't have to transfer answers from, from, uh, from a test booklet to an answer sheet. And, and then the question becomes whether um, certain uh, assistive devices uh, affect um, the construct uh, or not. It depends uh, what uh, we are assessing. Obviously, if you are assessing writing, then you, the use of spell checkers would become a modification. And then accommodations in the presentation format, they are relatively easy to um, to implement again, they just need um, um, slightly different print layout uh, with computer-based uh, text. The, the good news is that very often students can change the visual layout uh, themselves. Um, the question is, as I have mentioned, whether these actually uh, provide um, meaningful boost to the students' uh, scores. Um, right. So in the uh, in, in the very um, in the second part of my presentation that um, um, that will follow, I will look at some research that we have um, uh, conducted on some of these adjustments, and, um, and some of this research has actually followed the flowchart I uh, I presented. So, in the first uh, study that I will briefly describe, we looked at. Um, the uh, representation format, whether uh, allowing students to read and listen to a text um, if they have specific learning difficulties improves their scores or not. So that will be study number one. And then study number two um, uh, investigated uh, the effect of extended time on reading performance. So um, study number one was conducted in Slovenia with the collaboration of um, uh, Carmen Pijorn, um, Milena Kosak babudar and uh, uh, Michael Rataitzak from uh, Lancaster University. And we examined how the mode of presentation, reading, listening, and reading and listening together, dyslexia status, so whether somebody had an official diagnosis of dyslexia or not, and text difficulty individually, and in interaction which, with each other affected the text comprehension of young Slovenian uh, read, learners of English. Um, is this um, a modification? Um, yes, it is probably a modification because um, word level decoding is part of the reading comprehension construct, both in the first language and the, the second language. And in read aloud, so if students allow, are allowed to read and listen at the same time, they might not, they might, but, but they might also not uh, decode the written form of the words. They might just um, listen to, to the words instead of reading them. Um, so read aloud is a modification, unless, of course, uh, we conceptualize text comprehension as multimodal, which 
I think is the direction uh, we are uh, moving into uh, with, for example, subtitles, subtitled videos, but also with the prevalence of, um, of, of read aloud tools that are now uh, automatically built into Word, PowerPoint, etc. So um, we might actually be finding in a couple of years time that, that read aloud is not a modification because um, we should conceptualize text comprehension as, as multimodal. Um, previous research on the benefits of, um, of read aloud in, in the first language um, has been um, somewhat um, controversial. Um, although most of the research seems to point to some limited benefits of uh, read aloud for um, students with um, SPLDs. Um, so one, uh, there were a couple of meta-analyses um, and uh, one, of the, one of the studies has shown um, that test takers benefit from read aloud, um, test takers with uh, disabilities uh, benefit from read aloud, but the gains between um, uh, the gains that students with disabilities uh, uh, make is, um, is, is not, not a large one. Um, another uh, meta-analysis, sorry, the cursor seems to be disappearing. Um, okay, yeah, the, another meta-analysis um, of assessment, both in high stakes and in classroom instruction context, has again um, found that there is um, a small effect, a small benefit uh, for reading uh, comprehension, and, and this benefit um, held regardless whether um, it was a classroom context or an assessment context, or whether the text was uh, read by a human or it was a text-to-speech software. In the second language context, um, there was even less research. So the first, um, what I have presented were meta-analyses. So obviously that shows that there is quite a lot of research in the first language context. There's a lot less research in the second language context. So previous um, study by, by Reed et al. in 2013 uh, in the US with Spanish English bilinguals has found um, that um, Reed aloud had no um, uh, effect on how much of the content um, the students uh, remembered, and the students actually preferred silent reading. Um, Chang 2019 found that uh, participants preferred um, the reading while listening mode as opposed to the listening only mode. So they didn't investigate reading, but they compared listening with the transcript. And then um, another study by Kozan et al. 2015 found no effect for the mode of presentation on information recall, but uh, working memory capacity moderated um, the scores. So um, perhaps there is a benefit for students who have um, a lower working memory capacity. In our research, it was what, what, what is important, and I, I would like to stress this, um, uh, that if you want to examine the effect of um, accommodations, adjustments, or changes in testing conditions for students who have specific learning difficulties, you need to have a large sample size. Because if you want to make comparisons between dyslexic and non-dyslexic students, if you take a whole class, only 10-15% of the students will have um, specific learning difficulties. And also because you are investigating um, quite complex interactions among variables in order to have enough statistical power, you need larger scale uh, studies. So we had relatively large numbers of uh, students who were um, uh, non-dyslexic, but also we managed to recruit students who had officially diagnosed dyslexia in Slovenia. Um, we were very lucky with the Slovenian research because the system of identification of dyslexia in Slovenia is, is very complex and it seems to be highly reliable. It follows international standards. So it was actually possible to divide the group clearly into non-dyslexic and dyslexic participants. And we could be fairly certain that students who were in the dyslexic group actually uh, were indeed dyslexic. And we were also fairly certain that students who had no identification of dyslexia actually didn't have um, specific um, learning difficulties, which we couldn't do when we conducted a similar study in Hungary. And again, I will talk about the implications of this for, for research and, and assessment. Um, the students were aged between uh, 11 and, and 13, roughly, A2 level of proficiency. So these are kind of beginner learners relatively early on. 
in their language learning career. Um, this, we chose four input texts from the Slovenian um, 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 battery of language tests that is administered for diagnostic purposes every, every year. And um, two of the input texts were so-called easy based on their um, text evaluator scores and, and the flash Kincaid reading value. So the input text was perceived to be um, less complex whereas two of the other texts were, were more um, difficult. Um, there were six short comprehension questions. We counterbalanced the order of the texts. So this is the counterbalance design. Um, students uh, read two texts, listened to one text, and then listened and read to another text. So it wasn't fully counterbalanced, um, but this is um, the best we could do with the, with the, with the sample size and, and using intact uh, classes. We used um, quite a complex statistical um, modeling um, um, in, in R. Um, Michael helped us, Michael Rotaisak helped us with this complex statistical model that um, took into account random variation between items and, uh, and students. And the most important um, finding here is that you can see that there is a significant effect of mode. So students perform differently based on whether they read, listen, um, or whether there was a multimodal presentation. There was a significant effect of dyslexia status. And there was an interaction between the mode, how we presented the text and uh, the, whether the text was easy or difficult. And the most interesting for us was the last interaction, the presentation mode between uh, presentation mode and dyslexia status um, interaction. So what did we find? Um, we found no significant differences between the different modes for non-dyslexic students for difficult and easy texts. So if you don't have any specific learning difficulties, the same text presented in the reading mode, listening mode, and um, multimodal presentation mode, regardless of the text difficulty, is students performed similarly. Um, and the same pattern was actually found for stu dyslexic students for easy texts. So st texts that were, you know, uh, quite um, comfortably within the, the student's um, range of performance. However, when um, the text was difficult, so slightly more challenging um, for, for the students, um, the dyslexic students performed best in the read aloud assistance mode, um, the second best in the listening only and reading only mode. But there was also a difference between the reading only and the listening only mode. Students performed better in the reading only and then in the listening only mode. And um, Non-surprisingly, dyslexic students performed worse um, in, in all modes than, than students um, uh, who have no specific learning difficulties. So even after two years of um, just two years of English instruction, students uh, with dyslexia, they lag behind their uh, non-dyslexic peers uh, in English language instruction. And um, dyslexic students were better understanding easy listening texts than, than difficult ones. So how does um, that uh, um, affect, um, how does dyslexia uh, affect um, comprehension, text comprehension? What was interesting for our, in our finding is that it's not only uh, reading that was challenging for these students, but also um, listening. Um, and, and this is what we wouldn't expect because um, uh, we re generally conceptualize dyslexia as a, as a reading difficulty, but we could see systematic differences between dyslexic and non-dyslexic students in, um, in the listening mode. Why is this so? Because students with dyslexia are generally characterized by working limitations and they have also often language comprehension difficulties that are general, not necessarily constrained to um, um, written mode of text presentation. And again, this is something that we might want to take into account in our assessment practices that students might need more support uh, when, uh, if they have dyslexia, when they deal with listening text that contains information that the students need to remember. And we are testing their local understanding and, and, and we are testing how much information they remember from the input text. Um, 
the re results with regards to the, the adjustment, the um, presentation mode, um, reveal that um, for the difficult text, uh, the read allowed the multimodal presentation mode um, relieves the students from the processing burden of visual word decoding, and um, the, it facilitates accurate word recognition and the retrieval of the meaning of the words. At least this is what we assume, because um, this is what we have found as, as a beneficial effect of, of, of read aloud. Um, and it probably frees up working memory resources for higher level text comprehension. So if the text is challenging, if you don't have to read the, the written uh, words, then you have more resources for processing information, creating a text uh, model. So uh, it shows that dyslexic students benefit from read aloud more than non-dyslexic students when the text is difficult. So the conclusions from the study um, highlight that in low stakes assessment context, read aloud might assist students with dyslexia to demonstrate their text comprehension abilities, especially if the text is difficult. And the opportunity of using a read aloud modification might lower students' text anxiety and potentially boost self-confidence. So this is, we hypothesize this, there is no direct evidence, but we might think that perhaps this grants us the opportunity to consider this in classroom context. And perhaps read aloud also potentially increases engagement with text and, 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 and uh, increases motivation because reading uh, can be challenging for these students. And of course, if we um, use read aloud, we might need endorsements on the text uh, uh, certificate because read aloud changes the construct to be assessed. So now briefly about the study that we conducted in Hungary on um, time extension. And here uh, we didn't investigate dyslexic versus non-dyslexic groups because the, um, the dyslexia identification uh, system in Hungary is um, not very well regulated. There is no one standardized uh, dyslexia test in Hungary, for example. So we use first language abilities as a continuous variable instead of um, the nominal variable in the um, previous study. Um, what research on time extension shows, and, and this is simply, sim something that I briefly hinted at at the beginning of the lecture, is um, that um, uh, it might be beneficial, at least in the first, um, first language comprehension literature. Um, for example, Greg and Nassen's meta-analysis sh has shown that students with SPLD score significantly higher when they are given extended time than those who have no SPLDs. But more recent research has actually shown that time extension could also benefit students who are non-disabled because they could actually also gain uh, scores from this. And, um, and a more, again, a more recent study um, came to con contradictory conclusions out of the 28 studies 16 showed that um, students with SPLDs were not unfairly advantaged by time extension, but uh, 12 showed that the scores of test takers with SPLDs were overinflated. So it's not quite clear how time extension affects um, reading comprehension in the first language. And there is no studies, there were no studies before ours on second language. So our, this was a slightly smaller scale study 100 students and um, we, we, know, we knew from the information from the students that 18 had officially identified SPLDs. There might have been more and maybe some of the diagnoses were not accurate, but we didn't use this uh, score in our research. Students were slightly older than in the previous study and slightly higher proficiency. We used the APTIS 14 test, um, multiple choice questions, computer-administered um, test. Um, I think the test is quite familiar to um, many of you. And we used a battery of, um, of assessment um, to assess students' uh, first language skills um, that can be indicative of um, first language literacy-related difficulties, um, timed word reading, phoneme deletion test, rapid alternative naming test. These are kind of standard tests for identifying dyslexia. 
as well as um, a, a longer Hungarian reading comprehension test, which is uh, compiled by the Ministry of Education. And as I said, we used, we created a factor score and used a, a continuous variable. This is what the study design looked like. Student did um, um, uh, task one under standard timing conditions and, and test two under extended uh, timing conditions. And they did the dyslexia test individually. The results um, showed um, that um, um, the, um, the timing condition, so the yellow, um, the second yellow line, timing didn't make a difference in the student's uh, performance. And um, as you can see, there, is, there was no interaction between, um, between uh, test time and, um, and uh, students' first language skills either. So um, what does this um, reveal for us? Uh, in this test, um, the Aptis test, um, which is computer-based, um, short text, um, test timing didn't influence reading uh, performance. And there was no interaction with uh, task type, um, but the longest text only contains 350 words. Uh, we also measured the, the typical, how long the students took um, to, to complete the text, uh, the tests. And we found that the typical allotted time was actually sufficient for 95% of the participants. And none of the participants who actually went over time, so over the typical time in the extended condition, had uh, officially identified as BLDs. They might have been slower readers, learners, for other reasons. So uh, when we measured students' average test uh, taking time, we found that the current standard administration time is 30% longer than students on average needed. And you can see that this 30% longer than the average time actually allowed 95% of the participants to finish on time. Um, so if we consider that the maximum time that the student in our study required to finish the test was 35 minutes, um, then uh, we can actually make perhaps recommendations how tests should be timed. Um, we might need to measure how long students on average take um, to do a test. And if we add 50% to the average test taking time, then um, we might uh, perhaps allow everyone to, to finish in time. Or um, if we take the current timing, then adding the 25% um, um, as, as, an, um, as a time extension for students with SBLDs might be sufficient, but I would um, tend for the universal design and, and adding the 50% to the average completion time. And this is going to be quite uh, important for longer uh, tests, such as the IL test, which is notoriously strictly timed. So um, this takes me to the um, end and, and implications uh, for um, test design and, and uh, development. Um, I hope that um, this presentation has uh, convinced you that it is very important um, to consider the potential role of cognitive and first language literacy factors in designing test tasks and making decisions on test administration uh, conditions because they can pose a threat to fairness, validity, ethical uh, testing. Um, in terms of timing, I think more um, research piloting should be done that measures the actual time that students need to complete the test. And we need to add a generous margin to uh, ensure accessibility, not only for students with SPLDs, but also those who are slow for one reason uh, or another. Um, we need more research that investigates the interaction of test taker characteristics with, with test design uh, features, um, such as the research we uh, conducted in our research group or has recently been conducted by, by Vellis, um, and, and systematically investigating if we change certain presentation response format, administration conditions, how does it impact on the score? And is there a differential impact for, differential, for different groups of, of test takers? Um, and also in, uh, investigate the, the, the special arrangements um, in, in this regard. 
And, and finally, um, to, to conclude um, with, the, with the slogan or motto of the new neurodiversity um, movement or any, any movement around um, diversity, that no decisions should actually be making, um, should be made without involving those who, who are affected. So nothing about us without us. And uh, this kind of research is illustrated by, by Linda Taylor's research um, and, and I, uh, that has investigated test takers, test takers and stakeholders' perceptions. And I, I really do think we need more qualitative research um, that investigates how um, different groups of, of, um, of uh, students with specific learning difficulties, disabilities, uh, et cetera, uh, um, can actually demonstrate their, their abilities um, best in, in, in a language assessment uh, context. So thank you very much for your attention and also huge thanks to my, my collaborators in, in the two um, research um, projects. And for more detail, you can read two of our studies and, and our chapter uh, with Linda Taylor in the new Routledge Handbook of Second Language Acquisition and Language Testing. Hey, thank you very much, Judith. Uh, I found these studies extremely interesting and I also appreciate the charts you provided for dis discussions and decisions on accommodations, which you provided in the first part. Okay, we have several questions. Uh, I'm going to start with the hands raised. The first one was Neus. Neus, are you there? Richard, can you help me? Um, hmm. Well, then let's let's move on to Sheila. She, well, she raised her hand second. I think it might be better if we uh, if we go to some of the the written questions, maybe to start with, and then I can activate. Uh, the sound for the other people. Oh, okay. Was that the problem? So, so yeah. the first question was by Pep Moncada Escubairo. How do you feel about accommodating the assessment criteria in high stakes tests for students with uh, SBLD in terms of fairness? That's that's a it's a good question. Thank you very much for that. It, it's a challenging one. I think it's fair. It's a fairly complex one <laughs> because the assessment criteria are generally um, drawn up based on, um, on on construct validity issues and what we know about uh, how specific skills um, develop, um, standard setting, etc. So so um, I, I think assessment criteria. Um, need to reflect the construct we are assessing. And I think once we, we, we need to look at the construct, what we are assessing and, and think about, okay, does that, is, are there any aspects of the construct and how we assess them, um, systematically disadvantaging candidates. And, and I think perhaps um, less work is needed on the criteria themselves in terms of fairness than in the actual test design and 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 test implementation conditions, that's I think my, my take on, on on the question. But I would need to think more about the test criteria. We, we don't think so much about test criteria in in this regard. More more about test design and implementation. Thank you. Then Elena Gandini. Some students might feel disadvantaged if we tell them we don't provide the accommodations they're used to, even if research has shown that they don't affect performance significantly. Could this negative attitude towards the test affect their results? Yes, thank you, Elena. This is an important question and, and I didn't have the time to talk about it. So for example, this issue can come up with the colored overlays. <laughs> and um, 
and and I, I when I give, for example, uh, presentations to teachers, I think if students prefer, if they express preference for a, a colored overlays, which is an easily implementable accommodation that students are used to, I think we should provide it to them, even if perhaps there is no um, research evidence that impacts um, um, their uh, performance. Exactly for the reason that that then the th students think that I'm used to this um, accommodation, and that can result in negative negative attitude towards the test. So it's it's a careful balance in, in this regard as well. So if students, um, sometimes I think we have to provide accommodations that are easily implementable, don't affect the construct we are assessing, and that the students express preference for. Because I think attitudes um, are also important in language testing constructs, because attitudes and motivation can uh, affect how students engage with a test and then perform um, uh, on a test. Okay, thank you. Then David Djejeli, probably. The problem seems to be in life testing context that test takers with disabilities are never numerous enough. What seems to be a good solution if the testing center really wants to act on the problem? Okay, well, well, uh, thank Not you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Gergo, for, for the question. Um, I, I think this is the issue that you face, and this is why, for example, the role of SPLDs um, is not uh, so often researched because um, you, you don't have enough test takers uh, with disabilities. But I think um, Linda Taylor's research is a great example for this. You can do qualitative studies. You can um, you can interview students. Uh, what what um, what support would they find useful? What support did they find useful when they uh, um, prepared for the test? What assistive device <laughs> they used during the um, the learning um, process? Um, and and talking to the students. <laughs> and then again matching students' preferences and, and students' requests with the construct, with the um, resources of, of the test center might be a, a way forward. Okay. There are no more questions. Uh, Neus would like to thank you also for the pictures. <laughs> Budapest. Uh, and uh, well, are there any more? Oh, this one. But, mm -hmm. So okay. David, in practice, ultimately the scores matter, don't they? Oh, well, 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 I'm not quite sure what um, Gergo means by ultimately the scores matter, don't they? Um, <clears throat> whether whether students' scores improve uh, or how students score, I think it's more than just the scores. Um, and, and I think to, to go back to Elena's uh, um, point, we really also need to consider um, the attitudes and, and motivational aspects of test uh, performance, particularly in, in local uh, contexts um, and in classroom contexts. Um, yeah, but I, maybe I misunderstood your, your question, Gergo. Happy to continue the discussion in the chat. Okay. We'll take at least one more question because that's, we have the break afterwards. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. One question comment by Johan Fischer. If I understood correctly, one suggestion for hearing impaired test takers was to provide the listening test in writing, but don't we change the construct and test reading? In fact, we have very good results with accommodating the format by cutting the listening text in chunks and providing listening texts with video so they can see, fa see face expressions, lip expressions for students, for example, with cochlear implant. Yes, um, I mean, Johan, I think that's that's um, a completely legitimate point. And, and, and I know there are many uh, great ways of accommodating <laughs> students um, with hearing disabilities. And my example was actually an example for a modification. So that's um, when, when we ask hearing impaired test takers to read the transcript for a listening text, that's exactly what we are doing. We are modifying, modifying the, the test construct um, and, um, and uh, we are assessing uh, reading. Although, for example, if it's a transcript of a dialogue, certain aspects of, of spoken communication <laughs> can be assessed. But, but I, I fully agree with you. There are absolutely great ways of, of uh, changing listening texts that involve just accommodations, not, not uh, modifications. Then we'll also take Norman's uh, question or comment rather. In the Netherlands central state exams, end of secondary, 
There are special arrangements for dyslexic students, extended time in large layout. What is remarkable is that over the years, more and more students have a certificate of dyslexia. Yeah, so two things can happen is that um, there is an increased awareness of, of dyslexia and the more <clears throat> efficient uh, system of, of diagnosis. The second is if, um, if students who are for one reason or another, perhaps lower readers, they um, might game the system and ask for extended time and enlarged layout. But that actually takes us back to the question of universal design and shouldn't we um, schedule the test so that uh, students don't need to ask for, for extended time uh, because the, the test is timed generously enough and the students can change the layout in a computer-based assessment context, et cetera. So uh, there are two sides to this, to this question in my view. Okay, so let's stop. I think we are over time already. And the next thing will be the break. Thanks a lot again, uh, Judith. Highly interesting and relevant. Um, Richard, do you 